Hi, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Carl Giovanti from Carl Giovanti Consulting. It's July 19th, 2018. We're at the Nicholson Library at Linfield College. And Carl, we'll start you off by asking you why wine, or in your case, why wine consulting? Thank you for asking that question. That's a great lead. <laughs> um, you know, I, I like to tell people I, I really wasn't looking for wine. I, I feel like wine chose me in a sense. Um, I was doing corporate uh, software sales and technology uh, consulting and project management. And I was living in Southern California. I'd always been a corporate guy, you know, drawing the W-2 um, and so forth. And did that for 25 years, probably, in Southern California. My wife and I moved up to Portland in 2005. And the corporate thing just didn't really fit Portland. And I started thinking, you know, what else I might do. But I, I really wasn't looking for anything. In 2008, sort of the uh, key event for me with wine, um, I got invited on a media fam tour. And I ended up you know, not only going on the tour for three or four days, it was a friend of mine who was coming up from Northern California, a writer, and um, I got involved in planning it, the logistics and so forth, and after 10 or 12 wineries in three or four days, it was somewhat eye-opening. Mm -hmm. This is in 2008, mm -hmm. and I'm sitting there thinking, my goodness, um, you know, small business marketing best practices have not made it up to Willamette Valley as of yet. And, you know, these are nice folks with a great product. They're passionate about it. It's a lifestyle business. It felt so different than corporate consulting mm -hmm. and corporate sales and quotas and all of that. And I thought, gee, you know, I, I should find a way to do something. And, uh, um, because really there wasn't a lot of marketing, standard marketing 101 mm -hmm. stuff going on. With the small wineries, the larger wineries certainly were running um, their wineries and operations as a business. So I spent about six months visiting tasting rooms, listening to folks, talking to folks, just looking at what they were doing, how they were selling. Um, were they asking for the sale? Did they have a wine club? You know, were they, were they asking for, you know, my contact information? Mm -hmm. A lot of these things weren't being done. So then um, I was in uh, a restaurant at the bar, I'll never forget this, um, with Erica Landon, who people know from Walter Scott uh, Wines. She was then, this is in 2008, uh, the sommelier for a restaurant called 1001. And, uh, and she's great, you know, open, giving person. She knows wine. And I was saying, you know, I, I'm thinking about doing something again in, in the wine business. What do you think? She said, well, you know, if, you, if you're going to do consulting, you need to learn the business from the ground up. So go work in a tasting room. Mm -hmm. Go, you know, pour wine, sell wine clubs, and, 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 and learn how the financial piece of it works. So long story short, um, through a variety of different referrals and networking, which I'm very good at, by the way, <laughs> I ended up at Willamette Valley Vineyards. And I was uh, pouring for them two or three days a week. I was selling a lot of wine club memberships. And I'll, I'll get back to why I, I, I latched down to wine club. And then I started doing uh, their uh, afternoon tours on the weekend. And I was kind of enjoying it. And I was enjoying the people. And I was like, I think I can, you know, I can make something. I didn't know quite what it was going to be. But I could do something with this. I did that for about nine months. And then I decided to work um, a wine event that it no longer exists. It was called the Indie Wine Festival. So this is a good history piece. Um, it was designed for small producers <clears throat> that really didn't have um, opportunities or channels or venues, didn't have tasting rooms necessarily, but the event brought together all these small producers, you know, typically two, three thousand cases or less, and it gave them op an opportunity in a big venue to meet consumers, to, you know, connect with people, to sell wine, of course, and, and to engage, um, you know, with, with consumers. And so I, I work that event, and I'm, 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 you know, I'm doing dump buckets, I'm filling water, but I'm talking to people and I'm realizing here's an audience of all the people that really need marketing support, that really need help. 
And I'm going to start doing a lot of these events and meeting a lot of people. Again, long story short, because that went on for, for a little bit uh, in 2009, I met John Groshaw um, of uh, Groshaw Cellars, GC Wines. And uh, John, at that time, was 100% distributed, I would say, mm -hmm. uh, all over the country. Well, now he is, but then he had he focused on distribution. He really wasn't selling wine direct at all, and nor did he want to. Um, but the Indie Wine Fest that year took place in his production facility. So he was captive, all these consumers sort of, um, you know, in his space, which is usually just for production. And I said to him, John, I don't see your tasting room. You know, don't you have a direct program? The margins are good. It's a lot of work, but the margins are good. He said, no, nah, no. Nah. You know, I said, what about a wine club? You must have a wine club or loyalty program or something where you can, no, I, no, I just really am just distributed. I have friends and family. I do a couple of big events, Memorial Day, and that's it. That's all I want to do. I eventually convinced John over a short period of time that he needed to have a direct-to-consumer program. He's a smart guy. He saw the writing on the wall with uh, distribution challenges. <coughs> You know, we were actually in a recession at that time, so distributors were probably buying less premium wine and more, you know, entry-level glass pour type wine. So John's, you know, reluctantly agreed, okay, um, Carl, let's do this thing. So he was my first client, and he, <clears throat> you know, I like to say he let me play in his sandbox, if you will, <laughs> and, uh, and we did some good stuff. We opened the tasting room. We started a wine club, which still exists today. He now has his own winery with a tasting room, and, and he's you know, still heavily distributed, but does a good amount of business direct. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how, long story short, I got into, uh, into the wine business. And so at that point, you, had, you, you saw the need for especially small wineries, boutique wineries. And so how did you, how did you decide that was what you're going to do? Was going to I'm going to I'm going to do this for all of these people. Yeah, um, there were two I, I think important things that had happened just at the point where I started paying attention, and one was the 2007 vintage. And um, for those that were around back then, they'll remember uh, that it was coined locally as um, a challenging vintage. <laughs> the problem was that a national wine writer for a large national publication had panned the vintage. And there was not much damage control from a media perspective at that time. And so the 2007 vintage, um, there was a lot of buzz that it was a vintage to avoid. It was, they weren't using kind words like challenging, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think up until that vintage was released and, and that news uh, broke, I think a lot of small producers were selling most of their wine just at large events at you know, their cellar door, if they had one, um, and, and there wasn't a lot of inventory sitting around. On top of the 2007 vintage, we, we had the 2008 recession, 2008, 2009, great recession. You know, when you think about wine, it's a discovery category, right? And premium wine is a discretionary purchase. So. You know, when times are tough, people tend to um, be cautious about their budgets. And all of a sudden, between the recession and between this one vintage, we had some, we had some pressures that had to be dealt with, and people were building inventory. And as I'm talking to people, I'm realizing for the first time, we're building inventory, our distributors are not purchasing what they used to, I don't know what to do, hello, it's the third, you know, I'll even call it the second, uh, the, you know, peg on the stool. It's marketing. It's marketing. It's the hard work of running this thing like a business. You know, I think up until then, a lot of folks really thought they had a lifestyle career, you know, and, and, and I think some folks did. In the early, um, you know, the pioneers and the early folks certainly worked hard. That middle tier kind of cruised in and got established. They got their customer base set. But uh, 10 years ago, it wasn't quite as easy and it got really difficult. So then all of a sudden, people wanted to know about marketing. People wanted to know about wine clubs. Not that, not that wineries didn't have loyalty programs, 
But I, I was amazed over the course of, say, the first six years that I was doing consulting, how many clubs, e either there weren't wine clubs, I actually had a winery ask me once, uh, Carla, you were talking about marketing, you said an interesting thing. What was that about the club, a club? And I said, I said, you know, a wine club? And, and I had to describe what a wine club was. And when I started describing recurring revenue and predictable and repetitive revenue and loyal customers and having, you know, your own built-in base of customers, people started getting it. Um, I think at the time, probably 60, 70, 80 percent, maybe 70 percent of the wineries had a wine club of some sort. Today it's 90 eight mm -hmm. percent or nine I mean it's very very high um, and I had a very small contribution in that right I probably um, either created or developed or revised 25 wine clubs in the first seven years and and m most of them if not all of them still you know intact because um, there's a formula for what works and mm -hmm. you know in terms of people's commitment to giving you their card and what they get back in return and so forth. So there were some basic things that weren't being done. To answer your question, I decided I could do this. This isn't rocket science. This is, you know, this is marketing 101 stuff. It's the basic stuff that lifestyle and artist type businesses really don't want to do, but will continue to be pressed in even more so today at spending an increasing amount of time uh, focused on marketing, fo focused on getting their, their name out into the, uh, into the marketplace. So once you decided to do that, how did you go about finding clients? Oh, <laughs> very difficult. <clears throat> good, good question. Client acquisition is the tough part. <clears throat> By the way, it's the part that I'm very, very good at. <laughs> I, I mean, I was in sales for many years, so business development um, is what I don't get to do anymore that I really miss. Um, uh, but it's, it's showing up, you know. Um, I remember the, the very first uh, business job I had, I had to call on banks. And bankers were very good at working with small business people and they um, were very good at giving you leads. This was uh, data processing services I was selling, my very first corporate job. And so if you went into the bank and you met with bankers, they would, and you talk to them and say, yeah, here's a couple of companies you could talk to and they, that would be a lead and you'd go and pursue that. <clears throat> and I was always so amazed that if I emailed them or if I called and I left a message, I never got calls back from, from the bankers. They're too busy. But if I showed up, if I went into the branch and I sat at a desk and even if I just sat there and they saw me with my little blue suit, this is back in the <clears throat> 80s, um, my blue suit, you know, the IBM uh, uh, outfit, blue suit, red tie, you know, black shoes. And I sat there, I had my business cards and my notepad because there were no uh, laptops, there were no computers at the time, no phones either. Maybe I had a little Rolodex or something, just dating myself here. Um, they'd come over and say, hey, I'm glad you're in here. I'm glad you showed up. I've got a lead for you. As a matter of fact, let's spend some time and go through my small business client base. And I, and I did so much business just by showing up. So that is not only a tip to folks getting into the business, um, it's, it's also part of just business success. You have to be there, you have to volunteer, you have to put yourself out there. It's about networking. Networking is best when you're not asking for something first. It's best when you're showing up. And, you know, uh, repetition leads to familiarity, right? At one point, people were saying, well, God, Carl, you're everywhere. You're at all the events. I was going to all the trade events. I was going to, you know, all of the consumer events. I was showing up at tasting rooms. I was just trying to get plugged in well enough to the, the industry network that I knew where to be at the right time. And I, living in Portland, probably spent at least three or four days a week driving out to wine country. At that time, it was about only an hour drive each way. <laughs> now it's gotten a little, a little worse. But, but I would show up, man. My wife thought I was insane. I was out there. I wasn't really revenueing much. I had a few clients. 
But honestly, just being out there. And then at some of the festivals, like the Indie Wine Fest, I mean, I had to be very forthright and say, gee, you know, how are you doing on the marketing end? You know, uh, how's your marketing plan look? Are you able to, put, what marketing plan? Oh, you don't have a marketing plan. Oh, gee, you know, I'm, I'm writing, and I was writing marketing plans for, for companies, mm -hmm. right? Everything from direct to consumer marketing. Uh, that was all that I did. I, I think I was probably early in on doing nothing but D to C marketing. Many of the other consultants also did distribution consulting, uh, supply chain consulting, and other things. But I was just heads down. Let's just do the basics. So you know, it was tasting room, it was wine club, it was email marketing, social media, it was events, events management, it was sales training. Um, you know, uh, all the all the basics. And so I did that for three or four years, and um, <clears throat> and I started to accumulate clients. It's like, yeah, we need help with that. You know, we have a wine club, but we really don't charge anyone's card. How do you do it? Well, you know, we, we trust that they're going to come in. We don't want to be too pushy. We hope they'll come back. We gave them the discount the day they came in to, you know, member discount. Now, all they have to do is come back and buy the wine sometime. How's that for a business plan? <laughs> so we changed that on a limited basis, you know, in the big scheme of things. I've worked with 50 wineries in the 10 years that I've been doing this. There are now 800 wineries, you know, 500 are in Willamette Valley. So, you know, I did my little little part um, and uh, have had a good time doing it. Let's talk about your process a little bit. Let's uh, start with sort of what's the, what's the first thing that you usually go over with a new client? It has to be brand and it has to be brand messaging. <clears throat> Because if I'm going to represent them, if I'm going to, now I'm a publicist now, um, that's part of the evolution. In 2012, I became a publicist um, and, and I'm doing less marketing, if in fact no marketing at all. But even then, you know, what's the message? What's the story? Today, if I'm representing someone, I, I need to know how they're unique. You know, what are their stories? What's their philosophy? What do they want to say to people? What shows up on their collateral? What, what message am I carrying out to the media? Mm -hmm. um, but even then, to, to be able to talk to someone in a tasting room, we had to start with, who are you? You know, why wine? Why are you doing this? It's not a terrific business. I mean, if you're, if you're thinking you're going to make a lot of money, um, you know, those days even 10 years ago probably have, have passed. You could do well but it's gonna take a lot of effort. So really starting with the, the branding, uh, the messaging. And I, I, would, I do a, you know, I was doing a complete SWOT analysis, um, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, um, and trying to figure out, you know, where were their advantages, where were their disadvantages, and trying to minimize the latter and, and capitalize on the former, and, um, and, and then reflecting that in their, in their marketing. Um, and that, that, at that time, that's basically what, what, what I was doing, so. So as you, as you transition more from marketing into pu publicist mm -hmm. work, um, what are you finding, uh, are you finding most people are coming to you? Are you, are you finding them? Uh, how are you making most of your relationships? Yeah, uh, you know, I'm, I'm running at close to capacity right now. You know, there's always room for another great fit client that has patience and vision and understands the value of media relations and PR and getting media coverage. There's always room, but um, I'm sorry, repeat, repeat the question. I'm curious how you, how you are meeting most of your clients, if they're coming to you? Yes, at this, seeking, at this point. Them out. Yeah, at this point. I'm not doing any business development at all. I get lots of inquiries. I find that many wineries really don't understand PR. You know, there's a, it's a little bit of an arcane science, right? Getting third party coverage, getting expert, experts to come out and write your stories, review your wines. It really has to do with relationships to a great, to a great extent mm -hmm. and, and a lot of reading. So yeah, I have, I have wineries come to me, small wineries, um, and I'll have a conversation. I'll always have a one hour conversation with them. Um, and I do that pro bono just just because I'm part of the, the industry here. Um, 
but you know, PR and media fees are a little more than writing a marketing plan, and they're ongoing and repetitive, and, and typically annual contract type type of arrangements. So, since I'm not seeking business, um, you know, it's I get inquiries, but not you know, not as much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what are the steps you take now to get a brand out there, especially in a crowded marketplace like the one you're working in? Yeah, yeah. Um, every winery is different, you know, so I have a half dozen clients. Um, you know, there's a media plan, first of all, and uh, beyond that we create, uh, you know, target media lists who we think would be a good fit with their brand and their wines. And then um, it's a lot of uh, pitching. <laughs> Um, I probably reach out to 20, 30 uh, writers a week, not just wine writers. Um, I have a huge database at this point of wine, food, travel, leisure, writers, several thousand contacts uh, nationally. Um, so depending on what they're going for, you know, what markets they're in, um, you know, whether they're going for national coverage, whether they're trying to really focus on local only, you know, tasting room only. Um, so we'll create a plan, I'll create a target media list, and then I'm pitching in a variety of different ways, um, and a lot of it is based on relationships that I've built up over time. Um, we're getting wines out to clients, I mean that's a big part of it, sampling. I mean a writer's not going to review your wines if you, haven't seen, if you haven't sent them the wines or they haven't had a chance to taste them. Um, my holy grail is getting, you know, writers out to, out to Oregon, specifically Willamette Valley. This summer I'm doing, I don't know, 30 days of touring this summer, starting in maybe mid-June to the end of, early June to the end of, uh, of uh, August. I mean, a lot of people coming through. We have the advantage of Oregon being a very popular destination at the moment. Portland still is a hot culinary and adult beverage destination, and Willamette Valley is only 35 to 45 minutes away. So riders are coming, I know they're coming, I'm finding out when they're coming to the best of my ability, and then I'm inviting them and trying to, you know, and, and trying to create their itinerary and manage their itinerary. And I drive them and I handle their um, pretty much everything. You know, if they can get out here, I'm, I, can, I can handle a rider at any level. And if I need help from one of the associations from the wine board or wineries association, uh, AVA associations, you know, I can I can do that itinerary support sure. type of thing, but that's it, man. It's pl it's planning through all of those activities, and then it's it's tracking and follow up, tracking and follow up, and it's an endless thing. I've chased pieces for over a year, and they finally come out, and they're actually kind of you have to dust them off at that point because they're almost. But these writers want to write. You know, and they intend to write. They intend to taste the wines. Um, they don't always get to it. And the gentle reminder, the professional courtesy of a reminder, offering of support, um, offering of resources, you know, um, is something that goes on and, and it, it requires an awful lot of time. Sure. But those are the kind of activities that, uh, that I'm involved with uh, these days. So what's, your, what's the reception to your your plan, I guess, from the people you're working with or the people, even the people who just reach out to you who don't end up hiring you. I'm <clears> curious if they think this is, if they think this is too much to do or beyond them or they shouldn't have to do it or if they're like, yeah, that's a good idea. Well, if they're working with me and paying me, <laughs> they know what they're getting because I told them in advance. Um, I keep a summary of all the accolades. I call them accolades. There are feature articles, uh, uh, reviews of their wine, mentions in articles, um, scores, you know, awards, all those things. I track those. I have a report. It's called an, the Accolades Report. And, you know, they, I have clients from three to six years now that I've been doing PR work for. And, you know, if we looked at the oldest client, it goes on for dozens of pages, you know, tracking from 2012 uh, when I really started doing PR primarily transitioning out of marketing in 2012. It goes on for dozens of pages, so there's a lot of proof that we can get um, the winery coverage and media attention and write-ups and media hits, and there's a lot of proof to that. Um, 
and because my clients are three to six years, they know what I'm doing. Uh, we talk a lot. Um, the uh, repetition of my my efforts has, over a long period of time, has you know gotten to the point way past the point of trust. They know I'm putting in way more than probably they're they're paying me in fees, you know, just to ensure that the campaigns are successful and that they, and that you know, my retention's very high as a result of that. What's well, go ahead? No, I was going to say for a new client, if uh, someone someone approached me and said, well, you know, what do you do? Um, how do you do it? What result can I expect? And if they said, well, and and can you assure me that it's going to turn into wine sales? Uh, I could show them everything that I've done. Of course, confidentially, I would, I would show them everything that I would do in a proposal and lay out all the activities and everything that they would get that would make them media ready, right? And, that, and that's actually quite extensive. There are some basic things. Having a you know, target media list, having a media kit, having fact sheets, having text sheets, having you know, the right resources in the right place on your website so that writers can self-serve. All of that media preparedness would be something they would get. And then we would decide on a campaign, and then I would go to work. It's basically a sales job, right? It's selling their stories, their personalities. It's selling their brands, and it's selling their wines. It's, you know, it's a soft sales job, though, because in the end, um, to answer my own question, you're really not selling wine by pitching um, to writers, to journalists, whether they're travel, wine, or otherwise. That doesn't directly sell wine. That's a matter of lead generation, right? So, you know, my job, I feel, um, is that if wine is indeed a discovery category, I'm trying to create enough media awareness that leads people to that discovery of brands that maybe they haven't experienced before. That's the whole objective of getting your name out in, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in the press. For a new client, um, they would probably want to say, well, can you give me any guarantees of results? Well, I can give you guarantees um, based on the work that I've done that I will get you media coverage, your wines will get sampled. What I can't guarantee is it's gonna help you sell wine because once you have that coverage, it depends on what you do with it, right? If the coverage just is out there and it's not being used as part of their marketing content, if they're not putting it out you know, in their newsletter marketing, if they're not putting it out on their social and digital programs, if they're not saying, look at all the great things third-party experts have said about us. Um, look at what people have said about us in the media and the press. Um, if, if you're not using that coverage, because people really respect uh, other people's opinions about your brand, you could say whatever you want about your own brand, and many people will believe it. But when third parties say good things, you really want to use that valuable information, precious resource. So we generate a lot of that. Then it's up to them to take it and use it, um, you know, as part of their as part of their marketing. So what's describe for me the, like a most like a typical situation um, of a winery that would hire you? What do they What do they look like when they hire you? They don't have a communications manager. <clears throat> they have a very small staff. Hopefully they have a direct sales manager or tasting room manager so that I don't need to get involved in the marketing 101 stuff which detracts from uh, reading and, and, and relationships with writers and pitching writers and so forth. So hopefully they're well enough established that it isn't just mom and pop with a wine club and a tasting room and, the, and the, the children work on the weekend. That would be a tough one for me, mm -hmm. and partially because of the fees as well. If they haven't made the leap to having a tasting room manager and someone to manage their hospitality programs, um, they may not be ready for a media campaign. Now, even if they only have a third staff in the tasting room, they're probably ready for because the, the, whole, the whole effect of media is to sort of soften the beach, to drive people to, to the tasting room, to drive people to the website, to create awareness where there wasn't awareness, to fill in new customers where we're having attrition, mm -hmm. right? We need new customers constantly, not just because the boomers 
are drinking less wine and kind of fading away, but because people get bored and want to try new things at all ages, right? I mean, wine clubs have attrition 24 to 30 months. You need to keep filling, you know, filling the funnel. But people try different tasting rooms. They want, you know, there's, there's 500 tasting rooms right, right now in Oregon. They want to try different things. And if you count on the same, you know, um, you know, customers all the time, you'll be. So this, this media sort of continues to fill the, fill the funnel. And then you have an opportunity to sell to these people because they became aware of you. That's really the value. That's what I would tell someone who's looking at a media campaign that hasn't done that. Mm -hmm. And I would think that they'd want to have at least 1,500 to 2,000 cases of wine. In other words, you know, you can sell a lot of wine out of, uh, out of your cellar door. Right, um, and if you have a large wine club, you can get to a serious allocation. But if you grow much beyond a thousand, fifteen hundred cases, two thousand, three thousand cases, um, you probably do need to do some media outreach. Mm -hmm. And I would say, for me, the largest winery I've worked for uh, happened to be in California, um, and that was about a twenty thousand case, fifteen to twenty thousand case Pinot Noir producer in Carneros. Um, I had another large client in Washington that was probably 10 or 15,000 cases, but my sweet spot is probably 2,000 to 10,000 cases. 5,000 cases, and it almost becomes, if you're not doing communications, you don't have a communications program, you need to be doing something. Either hire someone, do it yourself, get set up to do it yourself, which I also do, I help people put together a program and I step out. I'll do it on a project basis, but, or hire someone to work on a part-time basis on your behalf, which is, which is what I do right now. So what are the most common challenges you're seeing and that you're facing when working with small wineries? Yeah. Um, you sure you want to go down this path? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, when I started, it was, you know, we used to sell all our wine, and, and I'm not sure that marketing really fits who we are. You know, um, I understand that Mark's important, but, you know, we're just farmers. This is an ag community, Carl. You know, you come up from Southern California with all the social media stuff and all this stuff that you... We're just farmers here, you know? It's an agricultural product. And... Um, you know, we'll get through the recession, things will be fine. So, so I think there was a lot of reluctance to really consider their business a business. Mm -hmm. um, and that lingers today to a, to, a, to a lesser degree because I think most people today understand they're in a fierce competition for their business survival. Um, and we're in the halcyon days of the wine industry, right? And they're still in a fierce competitive business. But, you know, aside from mindset, um, you know, uh, my business, my biggest challenge is not access to my clients because I've been working with them for so long. Um, and I can put any of my clients in front of a writer. And I might give them background information about what to expect or what the writer's um, sort of palette preferences are, or what their story interests are, or what story they're working on that we really want to focus in on. So I can give them some talking points that are relevant to that specific writer, but I could put any of my clients in, 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 front, of, uh, in front of writers these days. Um, my biggest challenge, really, is myself. I have capacity constraints, right? It's just me. Mm -hmm. I, I, I work seven days a week. Um, Fortunately, on the weekends, I don't work the entire week because I have, I'm in a long-term relationship. So, you know, we take time out and do things, but I'm, I'm full attention seven days a week. Um, so I, I just have, a, there's a limitation to how much I could do as a s single person agency. Sure. The biggest challenge really is reading, the amount of reading it takes to, to understand, you know, what is it that, that Rich writes about? What is he passionate, Rich the writer, what is he passionate about? Um, what types of wines does he really like? Really get him, you know, what's the style of wine? What's his preference for wine? What assignments does he have? When are those assignments due? Can I get an editorial calendar? Um, very hard to do, by the way. <laughs> I mean, it's doable. Um, you know, all this, all this 
uh, and then still run a business and still do billing and still do all the work. I do all the work myself. Mm -hmm. um, I have an admin firm that maintains my database um, updates and simple things that I feel like I can, I can um, delegate, but it's just capacity for time. Otherwise, it's an easy business to pitch. You know, Oregon is hot, Willamette Valley is hot, you know, wine region of the year. Uh, there's so many great initiatives happening in Willamette Valley and in Oregon. So it's an easy product to sell. Um, it, there's just a lot of competition sure. for it. So it takes a lot of effort to, to, to promote your clients and to be successful with that. You've talked about this a little bit already, but how would you describe your business philosophy? Hmm. 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 I treat my clients like it was my business so um, you know I'm painfully aware of their pain points um, pressures that they're under uh, financial or otherwise I'm aware of their philosophies because they asked I wanted to know if we had a good business fit or not so you know I, I treat their business as if, it, as if they were my own and I think some people are taken aback by that I can be kind of passionate about it. <laughs> I, I've had to now, in new client relationships, say, now, please understand that I've been doing this a long time, and I have lots of ideas and opinions, and I'm going to be making lots of recommendations. However, I understand this is your business, and that I have no decision authority in your organization. So you need to decide, and then we'll agree, but I'll always make recommendations, and we may disagree. Are you okay with that? And I, I kind of go about it that way. So then we're on the same team. Sure. And ultimately, they do need to make decisions. I, I can't force anyone to do anything they're not comfortable with or they don't feel is a good fit. I've tried. I was not successful <laughs> in this business because of the, the, the culture, right? It's just not a, a, a hard nose. It's a very subtle sort of, you know, people-to-people -people business. Mm -hmm. You talked about relationship building as a, mm -hmm. as a key part of what you're doing, and clearly one of those relationships you made was with us. I'm curious what made you initially reach out to the Oregon Wine History Archive, and, and what did, why did you want your clients to meet with us? Rich, I hate to tell you this. Aside from the history aspect, legacy aspect, the archival aspect, that is super critical and important and valuable and long-ranging and visionary. And I can't applaud Linfield College enough for having this program and, and me wanting my clients to be a part of that. I hate to tell you this, but you were just another media outlet. <laughs> That's fine. We can More content to use on our websites and our marketing, um, getting the word out, letting my clients, you know, be on film um, and, 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 and talk about themselves and getting their story out. So really, it's just part of a bigger media plan. Sure. I, I hate to, not, that we can take it. It's I, fine. I'm joking, you know, but, I, but I'm serious as well. Sure. Yeah. How, did these, how, did their, how was their reaction to their experiences working with us? Loved it. Seriously. Um, uh, you guys were professionals. You are professionals. I mean, it came off so well. It came to the site. You made it comfortable and easy, much as you've done today. Um, they loved it. And now there's an archive, a digital archive. What a unique thing. On, I think, all of my clients' websites, their, their oral history now is on their website in perpetuity until websites go away, which will probably <laughs> be longer than most of these businesses will survive. And in some cases, some archival material, I think, was donated in photo, photographs and things that you folks did. So, no, it was invaluable. Um, invaluable and a really unique uh, project. Uh, Good. So, yeah. You mentioned earlier that you were also, in addition to Oregon, you've also consulted in Washington, California, elsewhere. Tell me a little bit about your perspective of the differences and similarities between the industries and those yeah. states. Yeah. Uh, California, obviously, is the, the, the big driver and many years ahead of you know where we are here in Oregon. I think uh, many folks have come from California with um, innovative things that they've been able to put in place uh, and money that they've been able to put in place. Um, you know, I go to conferences in California specifically to see what they're doing because I'll be able to bring it in a few years, uh, you know, and it'll get adapted. You know, the early adoption is happening in California to, to new things. Mm -hmm. and. And it's the pace of stepping up, though, and here in Oregon has uh, really increased. Washington is somewhere in between. Um, 
you know, uh, Washington and Columbia Valley suffers from not uh, having the proximity that we have to a large population and international uh, uh, airport. Mm -hmm. You know, they're sort of close to Seattle, not really. They're sort of close to Portland. Um, you know, we're 35, 45 minutes away. They're hours away from their big population centers. So, you know, we have some, we have some real advantages. I think that certain regions have done a great job of defining themselves so that they're knowable and understandable and can be written about easily. And by the way, Willamette Valley is one of those. California, Napa Valley is one of those. They've defined themselves by Bordeaux varietals. You know, Cabernet Merlot, you know, Chardonnay, big, big, big reds, big bold wines. To their benefit, um, in Oregon, in Southern Oregon, in Columbia Gorge, in Columbia Valley, in Washington, they're making wines from all over the world, all over the country, lots and lots and lots of varietals. So I think what, what is unique about Willamette Valley specifically, and by the way, I only work in Willamette Valley now. Mm -hmm. I can't learn any other wine regions or service any other wine regions. <laughs> First of all, just me, the body of knowledge just to be able to handle Willamette Valley producers is tremendous. I, I can't keep up. But what Willamette Valley has done is they've defined themselves. They put a stake in the ground. They've said, we're about Pinot Noir. And now we're, we're also about Chardonnay mm -hmm. and other things. But those are, are the flagship varietals. That's different than most other regions with the exception of Napa. Mm -hmm. And there's certainly other places around the world and you could argue in other places in California that have defined themselves by varietal. And, and that's really unique and that helps me uh, in a big way because writers know Willamette Valley. They know that it's Pinot. They're learning and getting excited that it's Chardonnay because cool climate Chardonnay is a beautiful thing. Um, and it's actually fairly easy to market and promote. What I really like right now um, is where I see Willamette Valley going. And maybe this goes to a question, you know, with the future of, of, uh, of you know, the, the wine industry here is, but, you know, Willamette Valley and the personalities behind it, the, dr the drivers, the folks that are really making things happen, they're doubling down on on the Willamette Valley brand, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay. They're saying, if your wines are from Willamette Valley, there's something called conjunctive labeling. Mm -hmm. We need to see Willamette Valley on the label, either the front label or the back label. Yes, your wines might be from Yamhill Carlton, or they might be from the Chehalem Mountains AVA, or from the McMinnville AVA. That's fine. Feature that because that creates a premium impression and it helps you with your price points. Mm -hmm. But if those wines are from Willamette Valley, Willamette Valley needs to also be on the label somewhere. So we're trying not to lose the brand identity that has been built over 50 years by the founders and pioneers. And that brand identity that's really known worldwide is Willamette Valley, it's not the AVAs. So that's called conjunctive labeling, you've probably heard of it. The other thing that I think is outrageously interesting, and, I, and, and there are two people behind it that I think will be successful, uh, uh, Ken Wright and David Adelsheim, are saying, you know what, right now, if you call a wine Willamette Valley, we're only asking you to have 95% of the fruit from Willamette Valley. You could throw some Umqua fruit in there, some Rogue Valley fruit in there, and wherever else your Pinot Noir might come from, that's okay. But we want to move, up, move the bar up a little bit. We want to move it to 100%. 100% varietal requirement for Willamette Valley Pinot Noir, and I assume Willamette Valley Chardonnay, all Willamette Valley wines. There are very few regions in the world that have taken it to that extent. I think there's two or three, literally, in the world. I don't think there's anyone in the United States. So Willamette Valley is doubling down on the Willamette Valley brand, and I think that's really, really unique from anywhere else in the country and many places in the world for that matter. Do you think it's a good idea? I think it's a great idea. I think it's a great idea. I worry a little bit. Um, you know, we're in a, a, a Goldilocks economy, and we're selling wines, Willamette Valley wines, at premium prices. 
can it last? Will it last? Will everyone survive? Hard to say, right? Um, wine is a discretionary purchase. Wines that are 35 to $65. You don't take those lightly. I mean, you want to experience those. That's experiential marketing. You're going to be there in the tasting room. You're going to be shaking the hand of the winemaker or a great representative of the winemaker. And you're going to have an experience to tell about. When you start to get to $100 a wine, I have a client that's actually doing a blind tasting of $100, $800 Pinot Noirs, including their own, in bags, in front of consumers. You found eight $100 bottles of Pinot Noir, or seven plus yours? I mean, that was unheard of 10 years ago. I think, in fact, I would date it to 2011, 2012. I'm not sure the exact date. Maybe it was 2010. Um, the first $100 Pinot Noir came out. And, and I hope anyone who's watching would correct me if, uh, if I'm wrong about this, but I think Patty Green, recently deceased uh, Patty Green, came out with the very first $100 Pinot Noir many years ago. People couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe it. Now there are $100 Pinots. So, you know. Is that, is, you know, is that a model that will, you know, will be successful and how long will that last? And, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a concern. Speaking of changes in the last decade, I'm curious, from your, pers from your perspective, the biggest changes you've noticed in the industry uh, in your time in it? Yeah, in 10 years, right? Wineries consider themselves a business. They're faced with that reality. No one would doubt it. Um, People are doing or wanting to do the, the marketing things that they need to do. Um, I've seen a big change from 2007 to 2008 in terms of the, the media messaging, for instance, you know, in 2008 when we had the challenging vintage and it wasn't called challenging by this national writer, it, you know, it was something less, uh, something more derogatory. By the way, 2007 may be one of my favorite vintages, if you can find it. it. Turned out to be a beautiful vintage. The writer was wrong. I think retracted at one point, even. But um, we've got, uh, I think, at a state and local level, I think we have some really talented people um, uh, sort of steering the big ship, the Oregon wine ship, and then the regional, the Willamette Valley, and then even within that, the, the AVAs. Some smart people. Uh, dedicating their time, and they now have funds. You know, we, we never had a lot of funds, but you know, Willamette Valley Wineries has the barrel auction now mm -hmm. as a big uh, funding point for, for marketing. Oregon Wine Board, um, you know, back in 2007, 2008 was a whole different type of state organization, and now it's a tightly run, well-managed organization. <clears throat> Does a great job of marketing and resourcing nationally, internationally. So, you know, I, I think Willamette Valley has really come into its own as a legitimate uh, a revenue generating and economically impactful business. Mm -hmm. And just in 10 years, we've, we have 800 wineries in the state, I think, 10 years ago. Maybe there were 400. Tremendous, tremendous growth. But of course, with that growth comes challenges. But, but that's the biggest change, really. Yeah. Well, let's talk about those challenges. Let's talk about what you see happening in the industry in the next decade. Yeah. And what, and what are the biggest obstacles to yeah. overcome? Yeah. Um, I think to, 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 I'm not a prognosticator. Um, you could say the writing is on the wall. But I'm, not, I'm also not a pessimist. I think you need to look at the pressures today to anticipate what this will become, you know, five, ten years in the future. You know, right now, there are so many wineries, tremendous amount of competition. Um, you know, I like to say, and other people have said, the pie has grown because, you know, Travel Oregon and, and the different associations have done a good job of marketing. Oregon and Portland are hot. You know, the pie has grown but not as exponentially as the winery population has grown. So everyone's fighting for the same piece of pie they used to have, seeing it diminished a little bit, uh, hoping to grab a piece from someone else, and it's just gotten very, very difficult. It's gotten to where I literally recommend, and I've written this, I write an industry blog, by the way, 60 some odd articles. Uh, I don't write that often, but it's a decent body of work, lots of marketing PR stuff. Um, in one of my articles, I say, 
50% of total staff time, including the owners of the winery, the winemaker, and all the staff, 50% must be spent on marketing. Marketing, media outreach, building your brand, not production, right? Not growing. 50% on marketing, right? I mean, that's the new reality. Those are the new rules. Those are the new rules. So, tremendous amount of competition. Um, we have, in the last few years, because we've done such a good job of promoting the region, and we make such great wines across the board, you know, the wines aren't the differentiator anymore. Uh, everyone has good wines. That's the sort of price of admission, right? Um, we start at your wines are good, and then we go to, well, what about you as a person? What about you in your brand and your personality and your stories and so forth? But what's happening now is we've done such a good uh, job that we're, we're seeing, we're seeing uh, uh, corporate money coming in from other states, from other countries. I think a lot of it's good on the theme that, you know, the uh, rising tides lift all boats. And I hope that isn't a temporary phenomena. I hope that's a long-term phenomena. I think it would be naive to expect and assume that that will be the case, that the, the big boats will always bring the small ships along. But money being money and investors uh, being investors, um, you know, we can point to many other industries where, where things haven't necessarily gone that way. Um, so a lot of, a lot of money from out of state. Uh, can we retain our culture? I hope so. The culture of collaboration. I mean, it's such a, um, I think there are other places that can really say that they have a culture of collaboration, but it persists today. So, you know, competition from large corporations is, is changing things. I'm not sure how that's going to happen. Certainly price pressures, potentially. Um, weathering a down economy. The small producers that have got to get $55 a bottle. People aren't going to be buying that $55 bottle. Those large, you know, uh, corporate wine families are going to have a product to sell. Um, that worries me. Um, distribution, as you've heard, I'm sure on many occasions, um, there's a fun article that I wrote, which all goes to why you have to sell direct to consumer and promote your winery yourself. I mean, 20 years ago, there were 3,000 wineries and, you know, 3,000 distributors. I mean, it was easy to get distribution. Today, there are 9,000 wineries in the United States. Um, I, the stat I heard was 700 distributors. I think that's really high. I think there's a few hundred distributors, and I think there's 10 or 12 that probably drive 80% of all the shelf space, you know, retail shelf space, and they can't do business with small producers, right? Because they don't have the volume. They can't help that small producer build their brand anymore. So distribution has become a huge challenge. It's one of the legs of the stool that really is largely no longer available to a small producer. Thus, the need to take responsibility for your own marketing. Do your own media outreach. You don't need a PR consultant to do that. Hire someone. Hire a marketing person that could do it. You know, setting up a program isn't that hard, but, but it has to be done. It, I think, will be the key to, to survival. But the future is bright, and it, and it will be bright, and there will be survivors, and I, and I think it's going to be an incredible industry for years to come. Willamette Valley, Oregon is going to continue to grow, so the wine business in Oregon is a great place to be. Let's talk about your personal business. Where do you see it going in the future? Uh, uh, <laughs> the ultimate question. Ah, the ultimate answer. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, you know, I, I've, uh, I'm into this 10 years. It's, um, it's an, an, an exhausting, if you're serious about it and you, you, and, and, and you want to produce results, it, it's an exhausting um, and ch ever changing. You know, what I was doing 10 years ago is entirely different than what I'm doing today. Um, I probably have a five year runway, I'm guessing. You know, maybe seven. Um, I'm loving what I'm doing. You know, there probably are other things that uh, I and my wife will want to do at some point in the future. But, but um, yeah, I've got some period of time that I'm going to be doing this. And I might add some clients. I might look to coll collaborate with other agencies that have, you know, um, even longer term commitments. Uh, 
you know, to, to PR and media consulting and that type of thing. But, but uh, no immediate plans to do anything different at this point. And certainly not to go outside of Willamette Valley. Yeah. Do you think jobs like yours will be in more demand in the future? Are more people like you coming? Uh, I certainly hope so. Isn't it amazing that more Californians haven't moved up here with their marketing agencies and their PR agencies? I think part of the problem is the economics are different here than they are in California. You know, it's just a little harder to make a living. The market will bear a little less than it will in California, even in Washington. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of money in Washington, um, investment money in Washington that has ended up uh, in wineries, right? There are a lot of large corporate um, uh, businesses up in Seattle. So a lot of corporate money has found its way. It's a little less so even still here in Oregon. So, you know, the economics in the marketplace will only bear, you know, so much. But certainly I think uh, someone who's serious would need to, to make a really good living and to do it for a long time, need to build a small agency and be very, very focused on, um, on you know, public relations and sure and state-of-the-art, uh, you know, marketing best practices. If you were, if you were advising someone who was starting a business, trying to start your business today, for example, what would you advise them to look out for in the next decade or 15 years? What would you say is like, wineries will need this? Yeah, I've taught some, uh, uh, I'll, I'll answer it this way. I, I've taught some classes at Chemeca and I've had students that have said, well, now I really want to get into the wine business. And uh, I said, are you sure? <laughs> you know, it's really not a very good business. I'm not sure you want to get into the wine business. Are you really committed? Are you really passionate? Is money the number one thing that you want to, to do? Is that your goal is to be financial? I'm not sure that you really want to do this. You know, you can make some, pre and I go on and on and on and they kind of look at me. <laughs> and then they either convince me that they, they do want to be in the business and now it's a real business. I, I, I kind of go through that, 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 that process, kind of an old story from 10 years ago. It really wasn't a very good business to be in. But, but um, you know, you have to be accepted by the community. You have to pay your dues. You have to be on the committees. You have to be in the associations. You have to give that back to start. You know, it's a very unique community here in Oregon. You know, Oregon's a, a, still a little insular in some ways. Willamette Valley a little less, but you gotta pay your dues. And yeah, you could, you could, you could definitely do well. Do the networking, just show up as we talked about and things will happen for you. But don't ever give up. If you're serious about it, don't give up, make it happen, yeah. That's good advice. That's all the questions that I have prepared yeah. for you. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add? Anything that I should have asked you that I didn't? No, not really, this is pretty comprehensive. <laughs> Keep doing the good work you're doing and thank you very much for representing Oregon. Thank you for the same.